Tosti. The board has just met an executive session to consider matters regarding proposed pending or current litigation, collective negotiations pursuant to Article 14 of the Civil Service Law, the Taylor Law, and the appointment or employment of a particular person or persons. Now we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We had, I see, oh wait, don't leave yet, don't leave yet. Our American Sign Language signers, they left. Thank you very, come back, come back. Why don't you guys go to the microphone? We believe in maximum yes. possible embarrassment, yes. guys, I'm sorry. It's what we call a sheep. I'm sorry, guys. Please introduce yourselves. It's great, son. And Muhammad John, Muhammad Kirimov. What year are you guys and how many, how long have you been taking sign language here? ASL 2, so we took it last year and now we're in it again this year. And so what has it meant to you? What, tell us a little bit. It means a lot because it's something that like not a lot of people know about and it's not just like a visual language that's so different from all the other languages, but it's like in class, we do all activities and we learn about like deaf culture, which is like really interesting because it's like a whole community that nobody really like knows about and it's not taught. So yeah, and I kind of wish like I was able to start it earlier because we learn so much like every year. It's crazy. That's great. Well, what I'm going to say is it's pretty unique. So yeah, that's about it. It's unique, you know, a whole community, like she said. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yo, thanks. We appreciate it. So, thank you for coming to the meeting. There are lots of students here. It makes us very excited. They're always the star of the evening. Um, we are going to start actually with some recognitions, Dr. Z. Some big recognition. <laughs> Some great recognitions this evening. I just want to say that was no prep. That's a very North Shore student attributes, no prep, ready to speak and speak very openly and thoughtfully. Uh, thank you to our signers tonight. Um, we have two sets of recognitions tonight. Um, the first, and I'm going to go up with Dr. Smythe and Dr. McCarry in a second. Um, I'm happy to announce a new series of awards known as Innovation and Leadership. We are all leaders in our work, whether it is with students or staff members. Tonight, we recognize two amazing Vikings who have thought outside the box in a way that demonstrates an obsession with consistent improvement to serve the common good, to lift us all up higher, and to exemplify what makes us, us. So for our first Innovation in Leadership Award, we would like to call Ms. Anna aguiar Mady, our Director of World Languages, and just to the podium. And I'm sorry, embarrassment is part of the deal here. North Shore School District is proud to announce that Ms. Anna aguiar Mady, Director of World Languages, and ENL, was recently selected by the New York State Association for Language Teachers to receive the Ramunda Cado Award for Leadership in World Language Supervision. This prestigious supervision award was named after Ramunda Cado, chairperson of the Foreign Language Department at Christopher Columbus High School in New York City and a former member of the New York State Association of Foreign Language Teachers Board of Directors. She authored one of the first New York State syllabi for foreign language education and was the first woman to pass the Director of Foreign Languages Eligibility Examinations in New York City. Ms. aguiar Mady certainly demonstrates the qualities that this award was established to celebrate. Hard work, dedication to students and faculty, amazing curriculum leadership and professional development, 
and encouraging a spirit of innovation in her own faculty. We often joke, and some of them are here tonight, that the World Language Department members could organize a conference with one day's notice because so many of our amazing teachers under Anna's direction present and publish on a regular basis. It's so true. With a record number of students also earning the seal of biliteracy, the highest percentage in New York State, by the way, Anna is clearly lifting all higher. At the 106th New York State Association for Language Teachers Annual Conference in Syracuse, Ms. Aguiar Mady received the award and we want to wish her congratulations and thank you for all of her exceptional work and dedication. Thank you for all that you do. For our second Innovation and Leadership Award, I'd like to call up Mr. Alan Levin, our Director of Food Services. Under the direction of Mr. Alan Levin, Manager of Food Services for the North Shore Central School District, our district prides itself on being one of the few districts on Long Island to cook from scratch. Moreover, Allen is unique in also bringing locally sourced food to our schools. Mr. Levin has brought some tasty new offerings to all of our schools. Each day, our dedicated cooks chop, saute, slice, and roast their way to nutritious and delicious meals to serve our students. Fresh fruit, vegetables, and bread are delivered daily to complement our menu. Last year, Mr. Levin coordinated an amazing effort with the New York State Department of Agriculture and the Cornell Cooperative Extension to serve locally caught fish and create amazing food offerings such as fish tacos. He was recognized by the Commissioner of Agriculture who visited the district for this tremendous effort and we had an amazing kickoff event last February. Mr. Levin also works with our school garden advisories and students to serve food from our local gardens that our students maintain as tasting items in our cafeteria. Alan is a true innovator and perfectionist for the benefit of our faculty and students and is always looking for the next new idea. Thank you, Alan, for all that you do. I also want to mention uh, that our, our innovative leaders are also locally grown and locally sourced themselves. Ms. Aggie Armady has been a teacher uh, for a long time in our district before she became an administrator. Mr. Levin is a resident of our district and has children in our schools. And so we're just so grateful for both of you. Thank you both for all you do. Would Sophia Martini and Claire Tao please come up? Tonight we have a very special recognition of Sophia Martini, our valedictorian, class of 2024, and Claire Tao, our salutatorian for the class of 2024. Each of these students has devoted many long hours and an enormous amount of dedication and hard work to their studies at North Shore to receive these high recognitions. Principal Contreras said, Sophia and Claire are two exceptionally talented students. They have promoted academic scholarship, scientific research, athletic prowess, and artistry 
in multiple domains inside and outside North Shore High School. Sophia's academic achievements include the recipient of the Har Harvard College Book Prize, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute Medal, Bastion Loam Science Award, Long Island Science Congress Honors Award, junior and sophomore year, Junior Award for Excellence in Social Studies, American Citizenship Award, and Excellence in Mathematics Department Award. She is president of the National Honor Society, president of Mu Alpha Theta, and a member of the World Language Honor Society and Rho Kappa. Her goal is to pursue a career in the healthcare industry. Sophia is also a varsity scholar athlete and has played on the varsity soccer and lacrosse team since eighth grade and freshman year respectively. In addition, Sophia received the Community Service Merit Award freshman, sophomore, and junior years, and has volunteered at the local library in the PAL lacrosse clinics. Congratulations, Sophia. And Claire. Claire was recently recognized as a National Merit semifinalist and a member of the National Honor Society and Mu Alpha Theta, the National Math Honor Society. She is also fluent in Mandarin. During her high school years, Claire has active, been actively involved in science and has performed her science research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, focusing on global blastoma and immune system receptors. Claire's goal is to pursue a career in medicine and to find a target for glioblastoma she has also worked at a physician's clinic and a physical therapy clinic. Claire also has been enthusiastically involved in many extracurricular activities, including the president of the high school portfolio club, vice president of the, of the micro and anatomy club, and a member of the chamber orchestra and mathletes. Please join me in congratula congratulating both Sophia and Claire for their hard work at North Shore Schools. We wish them both the best of luck now in the future, discovering their dreams. And we're very happy that you're going out into the world to build a better world. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to move to the minutes. We're looking at October 26 minutes. Are there any changes or comments from the trustees? All right, hearing none, I will ac accept the minutes. Um, they will be adopted. Treasurer's report. I'm going to take Five, which is the treasurer's report six, which is the resolutions regarding the external audit report and seven, which is the acceptance of the claims audit report together. Do I have a motion? Motion. And I heard a second. Any questions, comments? I have a comment, please. <laughs> For which I have to dig out my materials, forgive me. I had a, um, a great conversation with Mr. Pappas the other day, uh, and um, I just wanted to point out something that because we've been talking a lot about um, tax, anticipation, tax anticipation notes and the interest that we pay on them uh, and the work that the Legislative Action Committee is doing to try to, um, or ha has done, uh, and continuing work through our legislators perhaps to um, be allowed 
or have it recognized that there may already be in place the ability to borrow from our own reserves instead of borrowing outside and paying interest. But um, so I just wanted to draw attention. Um, this is this is mentioned in the um, financial statements on page 13. We talk about um, our debt. It shows that our debt service has increased, and that is largely due to the interest cost for TAN borrowing um, and the accrual of ban interest payments. Uh, and I wanted to um, then point out on page um, 31, we um, also mention the, the report mentions these notes are recorded, these ta tax anticipation notes are recorded as a liability of the fund that will actually receive the proceeds from the issuance of the notes. And there are a couple of other um, good references to understanding how it works. What I, what I thought would be um, just worth showing, uh, and if I can put Jamie on the spot to just explain a very short version of how, though we do want to pursue the ability to borrow from our own reserves rather than going out and paying interest on the, on the, uh, to a bank, by if we are if we borrow the money from our own reserves then we are not earning the interest that that money would get in that account and just because you know as as we're paying higher interest rates today we're also earning higher interest rates today so sometimes it's going to be a judgment call whether which one is is the more financially recommended Correct. Well, one of the things we do talk about the high interest rates that we pay on the TAN, but when we borrow that money, when the money is not in use, it goes into the bank and we are also earning interest on that on that same money that we had borrowed on the TAN. So it does offset. And in and in some cases, because we are able to borrow at a lower rate, offsets even maybe even greater than what we're paying. Um, uh, if we can put it into the right investments and the right um, financial institutions. So. Yeah. I just wanted I that. I just are. wanted to mention it because it, it it was quite a revelation to me. Right? I was only thinking about one half of it and how we're paying out and we shouldn't be paying out. But in fact, you also you the, the statements point out that we because we um, received an issuance premium, it's called. Um, we also then got uh, pre preferred interest rate. So we you know where we might have been paying four percent. In fact, we were paying three point five seven percent. So. It is just, I guess, every year, depending on where interest rates are, both those we would pay as well as those we would earn, we'll, we'd have to make that judgment call, provided we even have the ability to, to borrow right. from it our own It does fluctuate reserves. from year to year. Right. Okay. Thanks, Thank Jamie. you. Thank you, Maria. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move to the report from the SGO. We have a special guest. The vice president is here today. I hope the president is okay. She's not incapacitated. Uh, no, she just she's all right. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> send, send her our regards, Eva. Um, this is Paul Petrakis. Did I say it right? Uh, Petrakis. Petrakis. Okay, thank you. Give us our update. All right. So uh, this is your moment, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> nice and loud. Yep. All right. So. The SGO recently just ran our second spirit week because the first one, because homecoming was originally postponed to later in October. So we decided to run a second spirit week with different themes. And we decided that for each day, the third period teacher during the commons would count the kids who wore like the day's attire. Let's say it was a uh, character day. If you dressed up in like, I don't know, a Sonic onesie, you got a point for your class and those points would then go to sports night. So we decided to make it a little more fun for the classes and make it more of a challenge. And then also on Wednesday, we collaborated with the environmental club where we counted the amount of kids who used reusable water bottles. And those also counted towards more points for sports night. Um, let's see. Next, we also have the upcoming uh, canned food drive, which also will be run by the key club as well. And that's about it right now for the SGO. And as for the sports of the high school, we recently had our girls cross country team win counties once again for 17 years in a row. It's very impressive. Our football team, although they had a good season, they unfortunately lost in the first round of the playoffs. 
Same with our men's soccer team. However, our women's soccer team did win in the first round of the playoffs, but they had an unfortunate second round exit. And lastly, we had the boys cross country team. Even though they did not win counties, they were still able to send Robbie Levy to the States this weekend. Uh, let's see, now we have music and the arts. And as many of you know, we have the music trip coming up in February to Italy, uh, Croatia, and Slovenia. And we recently finished uh, our first round of fundraising through the popcorn fundraiser. And then upcoming, we're going to have the practice-a-thon where you can sponsor a musician or you, they receive money for every hour they practice. And we have our upcoming concerts in December for the high school. And we have the ball play, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare. It will be next weekend, Friday and Saturday. There'll be one Friday night show, a Saturday matinee, and then a Saturday night show. And lastly, we just want to congratulate if any seniors are here for, follow, for finishing up their college applications and finishing their final first quarter senior year. And for all the parents, make sure you make sure your kids got all their work in. So <laughs> just gotta play this more. Thank you, Paul. Now you don't know our normal protocol, but the trustees and I will be here probably for the next seven hours. So you're welcome to stay, <laughs> or you can make a graceful exit and go home and do all that work that you have left to do. Okay. I'm, I'm caught up. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much and give our regards to Eva. We move to Dr. Zuglionis's report. I know you took a lot of my report there, Paul. Great <laughs> job and great to see you, buddy. Um, really well done. Um, and I know we have a lot of students here and faculty and family, so I'll try to be brief. Um, and uh, I wanted to start by uh, recognizing Dr. Smythe for the great work she did in organizing our Superintendent's Conference Day. Um, as uh, I have to remind my own kids, even though they're off from school on Election Day, we have school. And um, it's a great day for the faculty and the leadership team and the staff to get together uh, for what we call our Late Fall Superintendent's Conference Day. Um, I actually, um, Dr. Smythe created some space for me to begin uh, the day with a discussion uh, of a connection to the North Shore journey, our strategic plan, um, and how that connects to our faculty's daily work. We discussed the importance of the clarity of mission. We actually made a connection to Veterans Day. I showed a picture of my father in Vietnam in the mid 60s, and we talked about the with veterans. And if you have the opportunity to talk to them, that the most important thing is that clarity of mission. And and in, in that way, our work is very similar. We're serving. Um, and, and how we can do that all as Vikings together while having the flexibility to innovate for uh, the specific children who are with us each day. Um, we are tying years of different initiatives and discussions together from the North Shore Journey Framework. Our faculty engaged in deeply uh, intellectual work with their department leaders at the secondary level, while our elementary teachers focused on the meaningful work on the science of reading. Uh, with uh, Dr. Smythe and Ms. Ritter and our elementary liter literacy coaches who did an amazing job. Thank you to our curriculum directors, our elementary literacy team, and Dr. Smythe for your extra extraordinary efforts. Uh, professional learning and our professional learners at North Shore are second to none. Thank you. I did want to mention cross country, although it was stated already by Paul, uh, to congratulate our North Shore women's cross country team, our varsity team for winning the Nassau County Class Three Championship. While also having 10 runners earn all county membership, no women's cross country team in the county has ever sent 10 runners uh, to the all county status. Uh, the team has won, as Paul said, 17 county titles in a row since 20, 2006. Robbie Levy and Joanna Kenny won Class B state qualifiers and are going up tomorrow to represent North Shore and Nassau County in the New York State Championship meet. Congratulations to all. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, the important work of our maskers at the high school. The, the North Shore maskers will present a Midsummer Night's Dream on Friday, next Friday, the 17th at 7.30 p.m., Saturday the 18th at 2 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. This is such a great time of year. Uh, and I also wanted to mention if you are a senior citizen living in the North Shore School District, we would like to invite you to see the Saturday matinee presentation of a Midsummer Night's Dream on us for free. 
and be our honorary guests uh, at the 2 p.m. show in the high school theater. And if you are interested, you can certainly contact me, Betty, or the Fine and Performing Arts de Department at 516-277-7045, and we will reserve tickets for you. And we'll be blasting that message out in the next few days. Thank you, Shelley. Um, it's a great idea. I wanted to mention our upcoming parent universities on Tuesday. Um, we have uh, another great Smythe University, uh, the Science of Reading and Supporting Your Child. Uh, that will be right here in the Commons, the Middle School Commons. It's an important one. We are working on possibly live streaming that, and uh, we'll, we'll send out information about that. January 4th, we have Mindfulness, and February 7th, Elementary Math. It was so great to see our community come together for our homecoming celebration. Um, uh, two weeks ago, not only did the weather cooperate uh, so that it felt actually like a summer homecoming in October, but we were able to celebrate the ribbon cutting of our new turf field, um, which I think is symbolic of how we came together as a community to do something that was a demand that we all wanted, uh, but it wasn't easy to do. We had to think outside the box. We had to open up an existing capital reserve. The community had to support that. I had all kinds of football analogies on this of running a route that where you saw only defenders and you didn't see a way and we found a way and so i think it's a very concrete achievement it's it, you know not only serves our our school and our athletes but also our community our pal teams um but but also it's a symbol of i think how we can proceed forward as we face some challenging financial times and some other issues too uh, i'm so grateful to our parent organizations and our volunteers who made the day uh, a tremendous success um, as you may know one of our players ran out on the field carrying a, a blue line flag. Um, and as I learned, as I looked into the situation, I learned that the players carried the flag as a show of support for first responders because it was actually October 28th was National First Responders Day. Um, since that time, I've been approached by some of the community who've expressed concerns over negative meanings this flag has come to represent in recent years uh, as it's been used by certain groups that express hate and extreme beliefs and that set, those groups are separate from first responders. Um, over the last several days and um, last week, I spoke to many coaches and student athletes. They were just so open and Mr. Ling and Mr. Contreras assisted me, uh, spoke to a lot of parents in the community and here's what, here's what I found. Um, and, and I learned some things here. Flags are actually only carried by the football team on homecoming day. I didn't know that. Usually there's one standard American flag and one North Shore flag. Um, the football team players made a last minute decision to carry the blue line flag uh, to honor first responders. We didn't have any planning. It was, kind of, it was very organic and spontaneous. Um, the flag upset some of our families because of its more recent and visible use by, of this flag by extremist groups. But at the same time, um, our families and, flag, and, and some of our families and students see the flag only with its original meaning as a symbol that honors first responders, police, firemen, um, and emergency service personnel. Uh, and those same families ex uh, condone racism and extremism too. So, um, you know, historically this, this symbol is, it really, I think it's an artifact of an alien was coming from back in time in the nineties to talk about where we are civically and politically. This would be a great symbol to use from a historian's point of view because it has multiple meanings and it shows the tension um, of where we are right now in all communities and in the country. And I think as a superintendent and somebody who's worked here for 15 years, I'm most concerned about keeping us together and listening and having a good conversation about it. I can tell you from talking to people, some of which, you know, some of the students I've known for 12 years, knew them before they knew how to read. Um, I, I honestly don't believe there was any kind of negative intention here. And um, going forward, I think it was, you know, me and Mr. Lang, and, and the high school, we're gonna have better process. I think we do wanna honor folks. We wanna do it in a way that's planned and thought out at the right time. And so I think if, if there's anything to blame, it's, it's a bad process. Um, we'll work together with our students to organize and plan with the input of our administrative team. I know this is a, it, it was a potentially divisive moment for the community. And I was happy to hear from people from, from all parts of the community. Um, it, it was, I believe, well-intentioned. Um, and, and an effort to honor people, um, but also we didn't really have a process in place. Um, I want um, us all to stay united around the common interests of quality education and opportunity for our students, something I think we do do well, and we always think about how we can do it better. At the same time, we also want all in our school community to feel welcome and respected. 
I understand that this current situation poses a challenge to that, but I'm working with our leadership team to make adjustments and to prevent situations like this from, from arising again. So thank you for that. That was a mouthful. Um, and I, and I always welcome, uh, folks to talk to me about anything that they're concerned about and, uh, we process it as thoroughly as, as we can. So thank you. Thank you, Chris, so much. I know you did a, a, had a lot of very difficult conversations this week, and I think the community for their patience um, as uh, it took some time to unravel all of this, especially because of, um, you know, privacy issues and student issues and personnel issues. Um, so thank you. So, so we're going to move to our regular business right now. Today we have a very exciting discussion on student enrichment and interest-based opportunities. I think this is why all the students are here. Um, so I just want to let all the parents know, teachers, all the adults, please feel free to jump in and take photos of your little ones anytime you want. Do not worry. Be pushy. It's okay. I think the Facebook photo is very important. Um, so you have my uh, permission to do whatever you need to do to get that picture or video. Would you like us to move to the audience? Yes, I just want to say a few words. Um, and you guys can start moving. Um, but before I turn it over, uh, the presentation over to Dr. Smythe, who organized the presentation with Ms. Jen Imperial, uh, Dr. Marama Brook, uh, with help from Mr. Bridgewood, our elementary STEAM teacher, and Ms. Caitlin Mallon, one of our middle school music teachers. I want to thank them for all the amazing work that they did to prepare for this discussion on student enrichment and interest-based opportunities, which is focused on two big questions. What are the diverse academic and extracurricular opportunities that are available to our students to match their unique interests and strengths within the North Shore journey? And how do we enhance and improve these opportunities? Uh, the presentation focuses on the component of the North Shore journey dedicated to growth in areas of personal interest, and experiences and opportunities which allow for the discovery and a thorough development of passion, interests, strengths, and potential career paths. Um, I want to thank all of our students who are a part of this, some of some of you. I'm seeing your work. I've known you since you were in kindergarten, so it's personally rewarding, but you're, you are living the North Shore journey and your products of it, and not only are you doing that, but you're paying it forward by doing this community presentation, really committing an act of service to this board and to this community. So thank you, students. Very, very proud of you. Uh, I previewed the presentation last night with Dr. Smythe, and um, I was just so proud to be a part of it with you. So thank you, and thank you, Dr. Smythe. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak about our enrichment and interest-based opportunities here at North Shore. I will apologize in advance. This is a long presentation only because we have so many wonderful enrichment and interest-based opportunities, but I think you will enjoy what we have to share. And like Dr. Zublionis mentioned, I first want to thank the people who prepared this presentation, Ms. Imperial, Dr. Mabrook, thanks to Mr. Bridgewood and Ms. Mallon, and Ms. Green for sharing their students and their work. Thanks to our three elementary enrichment teachers, Ms. Goldberg, Ms. Krupen, 
and Ms. Mark Antonio, who couldn't be here this evening, but put together a video sharing their students' work. But most importantly, thanks to the students for sharing their perspectives about their involvement and also for sharing their work. And thank you to them for being a part of all of these wonderful opportunities and bringing their ideas and their interests because those are what really shape the opportunities that our students have. So like Dr. Zublionis mentioned, there were really two questions that drove our presentation. What enrichment and interest-based opportunities exist for our students during and after the school day? And what enhancements can we make to our processes and programming to ensure that we continue to meet the needs of all of our students, even as those needs and those interests evolve over time? So this, this evening, we'll talk about how this work connects to the North Shore journey. We'll talk about where it lives in instruction. We'll discuss the work at the elementary schools and the secondary schools. And then we'll talk about the recommendations we want to focus on as we continue to move forward. So like Dr. Zublionis mentioned, this work is inherent a really important part of the North Shore journey. We really believe that students having that opportunity to dig into things that they're interested in, to explore their passions, is such an important lever in their learning and their development as individuals. So this work is, is pivotal to students. It, it sometimes is the most important thing that they do during their, their school day. Um, you'll hear that from the voices of our students in a little bit. So like Dr. Zublionis mentioned, we have our four quadrants of our strategic plan. And one of those really important pillars, as you'll see in the bottom corner, is that opportunity for students to really dig into interests. So that's really what we want to focus on this evening and talk to you a little bit about. First, in instruction. We are truly fortunate here at North Shore because we have truly dedicated, talented, innovative teachers who are able to differentiate instruction to challenge and provide appropriate support to each student. That's really the first place where students have to, to dig into interest, to ignite new passions, to find things that they didn't even know they would be interested in. But also we have really careful programming which evolves over time including short experiences and opportunities. And what you'll see is increased opportunities for student choice over time. At our elementary level, particularly through our STEAM program and our SWES program, we provide assured experiences so that our students are exposed to things they might not otherwise have the opportunity to learn about. As they progress over time, both with our clubs and with our programming, we provide them with more choice and opportunities to explore more things. You'll hear a great deal about our elective program tonight at the middle school and the high school. And you'll see opportunities for kids to, at the middle school level, explore many things for short amounts of time so that they can try on a lot of interest and a lot of areas that might interest them. And then when they transition to the high school, they have a more of an opportunity to dig more deeply into something that they might be passionate about or interested in. Another unique factor in our instruction at our high school is students have the opportunity to choose from a wide range of courses and to choose the appropriate level of challenge that they think is appropriate for them. As you see in this um, diagram of our science pathways, students can move between pathways, choosing the electives and the courses that are interesting to them, but also, again, choosing that, that uh, level of challenge that they find appropriate for themselves. So really, instruction is that first way, we hope, and we really work hard at meeting the needs of our students, and we're really fortunate to have teachers who innovate and design around that challenge. So we're going to turn our attention to our elementary programs. At the elementary level, we have clubs, 
but we also, as I mentioned before, have assured experiences in both STEAM and um, enrichment, our SWES program. So first we'll talk about our STEAM program. Um, and we have uh, Mr. Bridgewood here this evening with two of our students who, is go who are going to tell you a little bit about our computer science strand within that program. So I'll invite them up to... Thing. Hold on one second. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite programs at North Shore, and that is our elementary computer science and robotics program. This is one of the many parts of our STEAM program. Now, of course, I'm very biased because I am, I am the one that gets to teach this, but trust me when I say it really is an amazing program. Um, so to give some context, uh, to give some context, the Elementary Computer Science and Robotics program is one of the core parts of our STEAM program, and it's an assured experience for all of our young students. What this means is that students as young as kindergarten get exposure and begin to develop deep understandings of computer science and programming. And this is far from just surface level stuff. For example, by fifth grade, our students are learning and practicing concepts such as conditionals, variables, and even functions. And for those of you with no experience in programming, I'm sure that sounds very alien, um, but it does sound impressive. And for those of you with an understanding of programming, you're probably even more impressed than those other people. And you can back me up when we tell everyone how astonishing it is that our young students are learning and practicing this in elementary school. This was stuff I was lucky to even learn in college, and here it is, we have fifth graders getting to bite their teeth on it. Now, we didn't bring any robots today, but we are going to get to see um, this program up here. One of the main tools we use to teach programming in the upper elementary school, uh, upper el elementary, is Scratch. And Scratch is a wonderful program and initiative that was created by and maintained by MIT. It is also championed by Harvard School of Education and is lauded as the gold standard for teaching programming, creative computing, and compu computational thinking. So basically all that good stuff is all inside of that. Now what Scratch is, it is a block-based programming language that is usually the first language children will learn or even young adults when they're starting to learn programming for the first time. And what we're gonna get to see tonight is we have two wonderful fourth graders that will show us a little bit about what they've learned in Scratch and the amazing projects that they created. Thank you. Oh. Bear with us for one second. Oh, oh, there should be a, a link in a new tab. One second.
I used the violin, to, not violin, I used the piano to make this song, and I used all the notes that were over there, and I used, like, all the different, like, time levels to see how long they stay and how long they're there for. So I made a game where you have to find markers and uh, you can move around by pressing the arrows on the sides to go to different worlds. Uh, there was this code that was switched to costume two, and I made a second one where if you switch it, it says you found the purple marker. Go outside the shop. With just that foundational bit of coding and understanding of basic computer science principles, we have kids just take this innovative approach and start making all these different things. So it starts off with just knowing a little bit of music coding, ends up with kids creating masterpieces. What ends up with just understanding how to make a character move on screen ends up with kids creating full worlds and games and environments. And thank you, Mr. Bridgewood. Thank you. So again, all of our students at the elementary level have the opportunity to learn computer science from kindergarten through fifth grade in developmentally appropriate ways with Mr. Bridgewood. Um, and that is one aspect of our elementary STEAM program. A second opportunity of assured experiences that all of our elementary students have is in our SWES program, school-wide enrichment program. So as I mentioned, our um, elementary enrichment teachers created a video for us to capture student voice.
Well, thank you to our um, SWES teachers, Janet Goldberg, Audra Macantonio, Mark Antonio, and Diane Krupin for putting together that production, and to all the students who shared their perspectives. Thank you to Matt for helping us. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mabrook to talk about the opportunities at the middle school. Thank you. Uh, so we are very fortunate at North Shore Middle School to be able to have over 35 club offerings, um, which is, you know, for a middle school of about 665 students, that's quite a large number. Um, and What's great about these is they also span various interest levels. So whether we're talking about clubs that are in the arts, music, drama, publications, uh, things that recognize student voice, um, there's plenty of options for our students to, to choose from. Uh, we also have, in terms of our elective courses, 29 currently running elective cycles, um, and 93% of our students are able to access at least one of these elective courses, and they span the various departments, English, Science, Social Studies, PE, um, Fine and Performing Arts, and Technology, with our heaviest amount of offerings in Technology and English. So when we see some of our club offerings, um, Viking Voice, our extracurricular chorus, our popular dance club, our sixth grade class board, which is how we kind of ease our students into SGO, and our organic gardening club, a continuation from elements that many of our students have already cultivated uh, in the elementary school levels, and we continue that passion through their middle school experience. We also have the North Shire Club, which is a little bit of gaming, a little bit of uh, Lord of the Rings lore, um, our Animal Rights Club, and our Mandarin Club. So again, highlighting as many different interests as our students are willing to come up with. Uh, we conducted a student survey uh, regarding these electives and extracurricular opportunities in which 65% of our middle school students responded to that survey. And what we found was overwhelmingly the majority of our students, almost 70%, um, <clears throat> indicated that they're enjoying their middle school electives to a pretty high degree. So not only are they taking these courses, but they like being in them. Um, we also ask them about their extracurricular experiences. We have um, about 80% involvement in extracurricular clubs and activities and sports. And more than 50% of those involved are involved in multiple activities and sports. So it's not a one and done and my season's over and now I'm bored. No, we, we are actively seeking out other interests and exploring our interests as much as possible. Um, additionally, we also um, asked our students in terms of, you know, what are you, are you only engaged in these kinds of extracurriculars inside North Shore? But uh, we also found that 60% of our students are engaged in activities both inside and outside of North Shore schools. Um, and then an, an additionally, another 63.3% were interested in becoming even more involved. So we have a very active student body that is always seeking additional interests. Um, we tried to drill down a little bit deeper on some of those um, student populations, and we looked also at um, what's made their involvement easier. And overwhelmingly, the responses from students were, I go because of my friends. So once again, it's those positive relationships that we're highlighting through our North Shore journey. Uh, it's one of the biggest driving forces for many of our students to become active and to join in. Um, and that was followed by, of course, if there's time in their schedules, the club fair, which occurred this past uh, September, was very popular and also um, getting the word out for a lot of our extracurricular opportunities. And of course, parental support which also uh, can play a role sometimes in some of the challenges that some of our students face, particularly in terms of scheduling. So for a lot of our students who would like to do more or become more involved, uh, whether they have sports activities or family schedules or homework that they felt was sometimes keeping them from really accessing 
all of the opportunities. And a small group of our students indicated that uh, one of the things that was really a challenge for them is they didn't know who was in those clubs and would they find friends in them or were there friends already in them. Um, so that was also a, another area um, of challenge for them. We also asked our students, what kinds of clubs would you like to see offered more of? Um, and one of the major areas were very sports focused, especially among our sixth graders. Um, our sixth graders aren't uh, given access to the extracurricular sports side. So that was one of our um, suggestions in terms of maybe bringing back our sixth grade intramurals. Uh, we also had a lot of uh, suggestions to increase our offerings uh, in music, the arts, gaming, and math. Uh, some of these were already in existence, but uh, they were looking for a bit more tailored options for them. So on that note, joining us this evening is Ms. Mallon and the Ukulele Club, who will be performing for us some of the numbers that they have been working on in their extracurricular. Thank you.
Thank you for that great performance. Uh, now we will transition to our opportunities at the high school, and Ms. Imperial is here to share that with us. Good evening, everyone. That's a really hard act to follow, and I cannot sing, <laughs> or I would love to. Um, so it's really exciting to watch the younger students um, and see all the opportunities that they have to become exposed to different things through elementary school and middle school when they take their cycle electives and you know they take facts and then they take technology and then they take art. Um, but what I love about being at the high school and that level is I get to see the students and work with them at the end of their journey. And they're no longer young students for the most part, exploring their passions, though they certainly find, sometimes you'll find someone who finds something new at the high school that they never knew they loved before, that does happen. Um, but really what happens at the high school level is they start to really figure out where do they wanna spend their time and what do they love, and they get to go really deep into it um, and, and become experts at that. They become young adults going out into the world now, almost experts in certain areas of things that they, um, that they find that they love. Um, and there's no, elective, there's no extracurricular um, experience that I can think of that's required. So everyone doesn't have to take art. Students choose to take it. Everyone doesn't have to take technology. Everyone doesn't have to take, so there's nothing, when we talk about a short experiences, by the time they get to the high school, now it's really they're motivated by choice. Um, so I think, and the, the product of that, the product of students exploring and working with things that they have chosen because they love it um, is pretty amazing as you're gonna see. So just to keep to the facts, um, we have 71 electives at the high school, which again, for a relatively, there are 748 students at the high school. So to have 71 electives and an enrollment of 924, so you know, I counted the seats in electives, there are 924 student enrollment, which is more than our number of students. So people are taking multiple electives. Um, we have 65 athletic teams broken down into the three seasons um, and 60 extracurricular offering 60 clubs and activities that students can choose to participate in. So that's the one area where we didn't really have stats, right? I can't tell you how many people are involved in a club because it fluctuates, they move in and out, the rosters change. Um, so that's where I decided to really focus in on my survey to find out what students are enjoying, what they're taking. So we did a, a survey on the extracurricular opportunities. Um, we had almost 70% response rate, which was really high. So I feel like this is really a good indication um, of how our students are feeling. And you can see from the chart, all of the grades um, participated in the survey pretty equally. So almost 90%, 87.3% of the students agreed that they were aware of the opportunities. They knew what the school offered. They knew what they could take. Um, a very, only a very small percentage said that they didn't know what was available to them. Um, and we do that in different ways. So for our elective programs and our course offerings, um, we have a course catalog that's published, guidance pushes into classrooms. The, the course offerings and the electives, that really takes place during scheduling time where there's a, a big push to make sure students are aware of what's happening. There are departmental presentations, um, but again, the electives become known throughout the high school through word of mouth, students' passions, the teachers that teach the courses, and things of that nature. Where our extracurricular clubs, um, we did a club fair this year. There hasn't been a club fair at the high school. This was the first year we did do a club fair, which I think was really beneficial for the ninth graders. Um, we have the television screens that are constantly promoting and talking about our electives. Daily announcements, we talk about announcements, things that are going on, you know, we promote clubs and talk about the good things that they're doing, um, and during our counselor meetings and orientation time. So we do our best um, to make sure students are aware. We wanted to know, are you involved in an extracurricular club? You seem to know about them, almost 90% know about them, but are you taking advantage and using them? And 88.8, again, almost 90% of the students are involved in at least one extracurricular activity. Um, 44%, if we add our green and our orange together, are involved in two to three. That's pretty significant. So students are taking advantage of multiple opportunities. There was only a very small percent of students, 11%,
that said they weren't involved. Um, and on my next slide, we're going to dig a little deeper because I wanted to know why. Even to go, you know, 90% involved is pretty good, but still, why are 11 not? Um, and I'd want to look at that. Um, some of the quotes students said about their feelings towards being involved in extracurricular, um, because there was a free response section. They said they like it because they bond with people who have similar interest. Um, they feel like, I feel like I'm a part of something bigger than myself. Um, the extracurricular clubs I'm involved in revolve around my future career path, and I have a lot of friends in the club. So now those 11%, I want to know why. Why are you not involved in something? Um, what was interesting to find is, and again, this is 11%. I did some of the, the math. I added that. You see that little black screen there. But these statistics in the on the pie graph here, that's, so when we see, I would, the green, I'll focus on that one first. I would like to be involved, but there's nothing that interests me. That's 9%, but that's 9% of 11%, because only 11% of the people said they were not involved in something. So the 9% of 11% is 1%. So there's only 1% of our student population that feel that there's not something that interests them. And again, we want to find that 1% and find something that interests them. Um, and you're going to see later, when we do a presentation, we try to do that. We're always open to starting new clubs. There's several started every year, and those are usually from student interest. Students come and say, hey, I want to start this club. Can we? And we do. Um, the biggest percentage, that orange there, that 35% that of students who, most of them who aren't involved, it's because they're involved outside of school. So um, I have some quotes here from those students. But they say, um, Rowing, one student wrote, rowing takes all of my time outside of school. So we don't have a rowing club, but the student is a passionate rower and is involved. So there, they might not be engaged at school in extracurricular clubs, but they are involved in something. They have a passion. They're active members of society, and they're doing something. They play on travel teams. One person said, I have ice skating every day after school. Um, so that's a, they're not involved, but they're still happy, productive, passionate about something. So that's a good thing. Um, the there was some students said they have too much schoolwork. Again, that is it says 18% there, but again, to make it feel a little better, that's 18% of 11%, which is 2%. So it doesn't feel feel that way. Um, but a, a couple people said I have too much homework. Um, I I have a decent amount of work, and I don't like doing it very late at night. So I'd rather go home and do my homework after school than stay at a club and and do that there. Um, and a few miscellaneous. Some people said. You know, in the other category, some people said they have jobs. Some people said they have to pick up younger siblings from the buses, and that's some of the reasons why they don't participate. But again, this is this is that eleven percent of the entire student population. So, when I started to think about what I was going to share tonight and how I could best represent what happens as far as electives and extracurriculars at the high school. I started, you know, I, I took to the streets. I went to the halls, I went to the classes, and I wanted to, you know, talk to the students, talk to the teachers, and see what they can share with me that they thought would be val valuable for me to share with you. Um, and in doing so, I wound up, again, speaking to so many um, young adults now, right? They're not, they're 17, 18, 16, and hearing how much they're passionate about things is great. So, Connor, come on up. So I came across Connor, who I've known. Um, but I, I came across Connor, and I, I, I looked at some of the work he was doing in Ms. Green's media art classes, and he did a trailer for something. So he, we, I said, can you come to my office? Let's talk a little bit. I said, I am not technological. I could not put together a video at all. I said, I'm going to need some help. I don't want my presentation to be boring. I need, you know, I wanted to, to have some, something to it. So could you maybe, he had made a, you had made a, the movie trailer. So he showed me some movie trails that he made, and I said, that's great. Could you maybe do a little trail that we can use as an introduction? So he left, he thought about it, he came back to me and was like, I want to do a documentary. How about a documentary about student engagement and electives at North Shore? And I said, that sounds great. Like, you, you run with it. Whatever you think, you're the expert in, in media production, not me. You run with what you want. Um, and he came back, and he had a script, and he had thoughts, and, he, had, and he, he put so much, you could see his passion just in the conversations that I had with him um, about planning it. So it was, I almost felt, and I told him this, and I told his mom when I called to tell her how wonderful he was, um, I, I said, I feel like I hired a professional videographer, media artist, um, because he brought so much to the table, and 
we're, you're going to see what he produced. But what it really is a testament to is this is as authentic of an assessment that we could ever do. So we talk about authentic assessments, and it's really hard in classrooms to make a real authentic assessment. We make authentic assessments to see if students could apply things in their real life that they're learning in math and science and English. But, but here we are. This is, I'm doing a presentation for my job. I'm presenting to a board of education, the community, Dr. Smythe, and I needed to produce, a, produce something to show you. That's a real life example, and, and Connor was able to do it for me. So that in itself, even though what the content of his video was amazing, um, that in itself is a testament to the, the quality of work that students wind up producing. And this is, this is one avenue in media arts, but it happens in so many other places. Um, so I hope you enjoy, I don't know how you won't enjoy what he put together for you. Uh,
Khan is only an 11th grader. We still have another whole year. Okay, we're still in practice. It's impossible to follow that. Uh, so we just really wanted to end with some of our recommendations, things that we learned from this study that we really want to look at moving forward. Oops, okay. Um, so again, we really think the most important thing for us is to celebrate the opportunities that we have like we did tonight, because again, kids are having great experiences that are really impacting their lives. But we also want to make sure that we continue to examine and improve those opportunities, you know, looking at that 11% and making sure we have something that really makes a difference for all of the students that we have. Just Our second recommendation uh, revolves around continuing to review the elective and club opportunities based on student interest. So each year, Dr. Zublionis and Mr. Perlis really review our clubs and we can take old clubs in a relatively new process we call shelving them. So clubs that kids aren't interested anymore and we replace those with new clubs that are um, more aligned with the current student interests. So we really wanna continue and, and hone that process. Um, and like Ms. Imperial mentioned, we really want to continue to investigate the reasons why some students do not join clubs and take electives and really dig into that and make sure we're offering things for all of our students. Like Dr. Mabrook mentioned, um, that athletics at the sixth grade level, we really want to revisit our sixth grade intramural program. Two other things we really want to look at this year, we want to look at ways to provide more space for elective opportunities in student schedules. Some students, based on our own programming, find it hard to find space to take the electives that they want to. And finally, to, examining, to examine our staffing constraints and our needs. But again, I think tonight we saw the range of opportunities that our kids have and that are administrators and our teachers and our students really invest in in really innovative ways but we really also want to think about what are the next steps to become even better so thank you for the opportunity and we will take any questions that you have It's got to start. Connor, you are the star of the show. My gosh. <laughs> I mean, that was unbelievable. I had heard earlier in the week that something made Dr. Z cry. I didn't really understand what it was. And it's, I mean, that was unbelievable. Like, you should be very proud of yourself right now. And, um, you know, so often we hear about so many students who are doing such great things you know, in science and in math, but there are all these new emerging areas that are so important and really going to be the, the, the future, right? And, and I mean, it was amazing how you put that all together. And I say that being a very big fan of documentaries. I have watched so many of them. It's the only thing I watch. Um, so that's great. All right, I'd like to open it up to trustees who I'm sure are going to talk about you too. Yeah, Connor, I was just kind of disappointed you didn't play ukulele too. I was kind of <laughs> <laughs> really would have been the full package. It's uh, very, very impressive. Uh, Dr. Smith's whole presentation was very impressive. Um, 
the team. Uh, I don't have too much to add. I just want to ask just kind of one question for those who are more familiar with, as opposed to the assured experience model, something that uh, maybe people in the community grew up with or experienced, where enrichment at the earlier ages was more of a pullout program. This certainly, I understand that all students get that experience and get the benefit from that. And in terms of equity issues, uh, this certainly addresses those. Um, but can you talk just a little bit about sort of best practices and today's contemporary approaches to, to enrichment at that early age? And also, I guess for, for those parents uh, who are uh, concerned that maybe some students who, for various areas, um, are getting all that they can to really be able to, to excel uh, at every level. Sure, so our um, SWES program reaches all students and really if you read the research on enrichment at the early ages, you really want to make sure kids have opportunities to really find their strengths and build on their strengths. Um, in addition to that, we also, as part of our SWES program, we have that arm that's for all students that all students experience, but we also identify students who have as you saw in the video, needs that can't be necessarily met in the classroom. And part of our Enrichment Teachers Day is working either individually in small groups with them um, based on those needs. So we kind of have the best of both worlds, um, really addressing helping all kids develop and find their strengths, but also for the kids who we know how we've identified as having um, particular strengths that aren't necessarily able to be met in the classroom, what can we do for them within the enrichment setting? And is it a fair assumption that those equity issues where we've seen in studies written by you uh, <laughs> that were exhaustive and very informative, uh, that some of the subgroup disparities have been reduced and or hopefully uh, at the very least minimized through, through those short experiences? Absolutely. I think we're really um, closing the gap for those students. And um, it is a way that we can address the equity for all students, because again, all students are involved in those activities. And we're also seeing um, that as a mechanism to close the gap. Thank you. Thank you again. Great presentation, Connor. Thank you. President Colasiopa, I'll be brief. I if, if all meetings had documentaries by Connor, this would be much more exciting. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Carol and your team for all the work that went into this and, you know, the 10, 24, 25 pages of backup that you provided. Um, I, I just, I, I think it shows what we do as a district, the, the outcomes are clear and we are doing such good work here. I think that um, the emphasis on the shared value to outcomes is clear in all of the, the enrichment and the clubs and, you know, obviously the North Shore journey, but we still go back to um, these assured experiences of collaboration, of, you know, fostering creativity, of deeper engagement and, you know, finding ways for our students to, you know, find their passion, right? And, you know, we start at such a young age, and I, I think that can only, you know, serve us well. Um, you know, I hope that, I, I know it's like 1% of the, the students, but, you know, I hope that we can find ways to engage those, um, Dr. Mabruk, you talked about like finding friends, you know, some some kids were worried about finding friends in clubs and, you know, maybe there are ways to make friends at clubs and, you know, I'm sure we can, you know, if we could get to every student, that would be amazing. It might be impossible, but, and you're already doing such amazing work, but I hope that we can explore those opportunities as well. So thank you again. Maria, okay. <laughs> I think I was grinning. I've been grinning for, you know, ever since we started this night. It's one of the, it's there, we have so many wonderful opportunities to celebrate. And these are the nights that make all this work worthwhile. Watching the teachers and our, our assistant principals ex, ex, exude pride. I, I feel it myself. It's very, very exciting. And um, Connor, thank you for being one of the shining examples tonight. It was very fun. Um, to see the students representing themselves 
and then Jen, you really kind of blew me away with how you just you just were so proud up there. <laughs> it was it was great fun. So I, I I really enjoyed it, Carol. Everyone's under your incredible leadership. We have so many wonderful things to celebrate. Um, it's hard not to go on and on. I I also um, was I'm grateful to um, Trustee Ludmar for his question to you because I I I remember Swess being really um, a great example of how we it, it's it's one of the things I've sorry one of the things I I think about when we hear the presentations that we hear throughout the year about our various um, curricular offerings as well as that that we uh, really address both the both the extra needs as well uh, extra needs at every end of the spectrum the ones who need a little bit of remedial work as well as the ones who need um, more challenge and that was a very interesting thing about the SWES video was that a lot of those children spoke about you know feeling a little bit um, bored in class or a little bit that they wanted more and so they uh, they referred to their their folders their authentic folders what was the um, they're called anchor folders. Sorry, anchor folders. Yeah, um, that's I didn't remember the term from when my daughter was in elementary school, but it sounded it sounded great. Um, and I do remember, you know, um, seeing those children thrive in in various situations like that. So that was a great example. Um, the one percent uh, was a great question. What? Who are these eleven percent, and and why? Um, I was very glad you delved into that a little bit, and it just occurred to me, just one thing that occurred to me to just throw into the mix of when you think about this is that, um, I, you know, it was sad to see that there, there are kids who work after school, maybe because they have to, uh, and, and can't, um, simply can't participate because they have those kinds of commitments, and I thought it could be, it could be interesting to see if they have thoughts about how they could bring their work to some kind of maybe a presentation or a, or a um, I know they already say they don't have time, but if there's, you know, even if there's one period each quarter or, or each semester where they can be invited in to share their experience, um, it, it might be an interesting approach. No, Jen, go back up to the mic uh, microphone if you can. Talking, um, that survey was on extracurricular clubs. Fortunately, our students who work, or you know, and there's some, there are some students who work out of need or have to pick up younger younger siblings because their parents work and things like that. And again, I don't have the data, so this is purely speculative. And just knowing knowing the kids, how I know them, and knowing students who are in the situation, those students do still benefit from our electives because those are courses right. during the day. That's so they're not completely not engaged in their passions. They may be, you know, an IPA student who gets to spend two periods in art or in um, in like some of the science classes or the forensics classes. So that, that data was on extracurricular only. Um, so where they're saying they can't stay after school, many of them who I actually personally know who work after school and who do things like that are using the nine period day to, to delve into their interest. Um, through the electives. Thank you. That's so that's just another thing to think about. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. And makes me feel better. For I want to make <laughs> <Right>. you feel better. <laughs> um, the last thing I wanted to just mention, that I, I love that one of your recommendations, Carol, is to revisit the sixth grade intramural program. I, I definitely think we've talked about that in, in different contexts up here quite a bit, but I think uh, intramurals definitely for the sixth graders and even for the seventh and eighth graders in middle school um and potentially beyond as long as we're dreaming but i mean for the for the kids who want to be involved athletically or and you know physically challenging themselves without competition i think is um is a really worthwhile effort to make thank you and thank you everybody and especially to those who stayed mm -hmm. <laughs> rich okay. i want to thank everybody involved with the this very thorough and enlightening presentation. It, it was great to see. Um, 
I, I was just curious in terms of at the elementary schools, how do, do the teachers have enough flexibility in terms of time to work this in, or is it is it a struggle for them because they are doing so many things, and uh, what what we saw tonight is crucial. It's it's really important, but. I just was wondering, you know, in the course of their daily activities, does it at time become stressful for them? Because they have, they've got a classroom full of kids that have all different needs. And the enrichment that you're looking at is going to be very different on an individual basis. So it's got to be a really difficult thing to manage. Yeah, I think you bring up two um, important points. One, um, our elementary day is tight. We do do a lot of amazing things for students. We have SWES, we have STEAM, um, we have FLESS, um, and then we have you know English, science, social studies, and math. So it is it is tight. Um, I think our teachers do an amazing job of navigating that in terms of fitting everything in. Um, but I wouldn't say it is with it is easy for them to do that. Um, and then you also bring up the the wide range of needs that students have. Um, and again, I think our teachers do an, a really a, a wonderful job getting to know students, getting to know their strengths, getting to know their challenges, and really trying to meet those needs um, in the classroom, but then also um, making great use of our enrichment teachers and our STEAM teachers. Um, but I wouldn't say it, it's easy. <laughs> the, the other question I had was um, on a high school level, I, the extracurricular activities, uh, you know, I think North Shore is probably better than any other school on Long Island in terms of the offerings that we have available to students, particularly on the secondary level, although it's extensive at the lower grades as well. The, the question I had was one of the comments was about um, talking about you know, elective courses and the ability for students to really maximize those options. And again, it's a tough, tough question to deal with because there's so many constraints. So I'm just curious, you know, are, are we looking at or what are we looking at in terms of trying to free them up a little bit to have a greater availability to pursue some of these things. That was actually one of the real benefits of, of doing this um, to kind of deep dive. Miss Imperial had some great ideas um, and Dr. Zulionis um, and myself with um, the high school team are looking at ways to free up space, particularly um, in particular grade levels and for students in particular programs. So. You know, some things that we have we put in place are placing constraints on students' times, and that's what we really want to unpack for kids as we go into um, next year and, and future years. Um, well, this was tremendous. I got to see my both my one child last week, <laughs> my other one, everyone. I, but I mean. Two, two board members got a performance from their own kids, which is kind of special. Um, but thank you for that amazing video. I'm glad that you weren't, I didn't know about your skills before I put together my daughter's bat mitzvah video because I would have hit you hard for some help. Um, but um, this has been incredible. I've been so looking forward to this evening and this discussion because I am a true believer that I mean, kids have to go to school, but this really, the types of things that we were talking about, um, today is what gets them excited to come to school. I mean, you know, it's it's what, you know, I've seen it in my own home. I don't want to go, go to school today, but I have, I, I get to have this club or I get to, I, my my son in, at Seacliff School is going to school early in the morning, three out of five days because he self-selects, he gets himself out of bed, he makes his own lunch. And, you know, I hate to use my own personal stories, but it, it just so hits home for me how important these opportunities are for really self-development, self-discovery, and, and loving coming to school, which is what I want for all the kids in our district, and I say it all the time. Um, I loved 
hearing, so starting in the elementary school level, I something that we didn't get to talk about and I'm, I'm also very interested in is the differentiated learning and the identity piece of that where, you know, if you have been tagged or self-identified as somebody who gets support in, in either realm from the from the remediation level to getting support at the, uh, you know, that you need higher, there's a continuity piece and a, and sort of an identity piece to that that I think is not talked about uh, very often that um, I think it, it's like a, co a commitment that we're making in a way. And so I am interested in, in exploring that and maybe codifying some, some, some processes potentially um, so that kids understand the commitment that we're making to them because learning isn't li linear, right? So you, you have good years, you have bad years, you have good semesters, you have bad semesters, and it, it's, a, it's a long game. So I, I, I'm, I'm interested, it didn't come up tonight, but it's part of my thinking that I wanted to share about this whole realm. Seems like you wanna say something. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I loved that we talked about, um, th that um, Ms. Imperial talked about identifying the people who are not part of the clubs. That was part of my um, thinking and I, I'm, I'm interested in exploring more of that 20% who are not involved in the extracurriculars in the middle school as well. I think it's so interesting that when we kind of, you, it's such an opportunity to also identify at-risk kids and uh, um, the kids from the fringes that need something different that we aren't even thinking of because they don't know to ask for it. Um, because it seems like a lot of these clubs are really the, the self-starting kids who are who who have that craving and the skills and the wherewithal to to be able to to create that for themselves and for the community, which is great. But may, maybe there's some some missed opportunity there that we could further identify um, with some some d deep diving. Um, I also I also am interested in this assured experiences when we look at the three buildings, and you know I've talked about this before. At the elementary school level, of course, you know, they're siblings, they're not twins, and they all have their own unique needs. But at the same time, I, I think there's an opportunity there to learn from best practices. Even watching the video, you could identify the different school buildings by how the kids talked about the enrichments that, and the swests that they were talking about. There was, there was a, there was like a, there was a different, um, there was a freer feeling in some of the buildings where it was a more practice feeling in some of the buildings. And I think that, um, I'm, I'm not overstating what that was, but I just, I, I want us to have three incredible schools. So borrowing from best practices from each seems, you know, if, if one school hasn't identified the need yet, maybe they can learn from the others. I know, I know you think that way, but I just didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to remind us all. Um, I loved seeing the language clubs. I think there's no surprise that we're, we, you know, that our language department has, um, this incredible biliteracy achievement that we're excelling in because, you know, the, these kids can self-select to further double down on their language learning. And I, it seems like all the languages are representative. And so I just wonder if there are languages that are not, is there an opportunity to create a club and make it a richer experience for for those languages that are maybe not yet um, having clubs. Um, and I just have two other points, which is when, when we talked about these clubs and when we're doing analysis of who's in them, I, I'm sort of interested to see the IEP population and our special needs population and is, what are, are there any patterns there and any missed opportunities? I, I don't know if there are or there aren't. So I, I'm curious about it. Um, I'm sorry I didn't pose that in advance. It just came to me during the presentation. And then the last point, and I think I did um, mention this in, in an email, but the the lunch time, uh, particularly at the middle school, I, I can't miss an opportunity to re really amplify the, the um, the importance that I see for, for for like maker space is the one that I use as an example. Um, the lunchtime for certain kids, especially in sixth grade, when you're entering the new building and you're mingling, is very very stressful. I you know I know from firsthand experience with my family, but also like 
understanding from other kids and having something like a makerspace or different lunchtime options, which I know are available, it is such a lifeline for the integration beyond beyond the interest space, which is it's it's like a special gift. So, um, and I'm not sure that like whenever I mention it for years, I mean we're three years into the middle school now, people just don't know about it. And if we're gonna do it, let's do it. Like let's let's codify it, let's have it decide who gets it, let's make it part of our culture, not, you know, who's going to get it. <laughs> like, it's been very secretive. Nobody, I, I just feel like there's opportunity there to really um, make it, uh, integrate it more into what we're doing and, and um, codify it. And um, I just think it's really, really special as a feeder into some of this other STEAM possibilities that we have. And it has benefits beyond that, that are um, really, I, I think are worth, what am I doing? Advocating for. So that's what I've done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, some like amazing presentation and really great backup that I know the public doesn't get to see, but we get to enjoy. Um, so thank you, Carol, for all that. I'm going to start with, um, the SWES portion. I, I, I'm so proud of us for offering SWES. Um, I, I'm, not all schools do it. Not all schools do it the way that we do it. Um, and the idea that it's, um, on an individual basis as well as a school wide and basis, I think is great. And it really gives our students an opportunity to learn without like pressure of tests and homework and, you know, the fear of failure. So I, I, I think it's really like a, f like a free place for them to, to dive into whatever they're interested in. I, I, I so my question to you is what are we doing for the kids who um, need enrichment prior to fourth and fifth grade? So two things. One, um, the teachers are differentiating, but also our enrichment teachers are, if we see a student with a need, they'll work with the classroom teacher to provide, whether it's materials or um, instructional approaches to support those students. Okay, I, I want to make sure. And so are they ever pulled out by the SWES teacher? Um, not frequently, but it okay. does happen. In some, okay, that's great because in my job as a psychologist, I do a lot of psychological testing. I've tested a lot of gifted kids and in the neighboring districts, there really are no services that are available for these kids. And I always brag that at North Shore, we do have stuff available. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, the, in terms of the identification, I know it was in the, the, um, backup but I did want to say it here that um, there is a myth that kids who need enrichment present as highly motivated and sort of excellent students, like good students, but often the kids who, and I know you know this, often the kids who really need enrichment services don't present that way. And so I know that you have done a lot of work in um, improving the identification process. So I don't know if you could just speak a little bit about that. Sure. Um, our enrichment teachers um, worked with our principals, and I was involved in that. Um, and we really try to look at multiple measures. So um, we look at um, many points of data, such as we give the COGATs, we have assessment scores. Um, we look at information from the teacher, from the enrichment specialist, from the parent, and any of those avenues can make a recommendation, and then that's when the um, enrichment teacher would kind of move to that next level of, of assessing the student. But to your point, we really are trying not to miss those students. We're not just looking at the, the child who scores high on a particular exam. We're trying to look at the whole child and really find out if there is a need, what that need is, and then how can we um, address it. So, so part of what you've done is educate teachers on sort of the asynchronous development presentation that these kids have, right? So there's the idea that gifted kids are sort of um, gifted across the board, which is just not true, that they have, um, the brain is modular and there's certain areas that they're better at. and so. It's important that the teachers are able to recognize this. 
Um, and then, of course, in the special education population, the rates of gifted kids are higher than in the general population. So can you just speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, what often happens is if a student um, has a learning disability, it might mask their particular strength. So um, we really want to get to, uh, kind of under the under the, the top level and look at what are the, the students' um, learning challenges and in what ways, if any, are those learning challenges masking a particular um, strength? Because to your point, uh, a very large percentage of students who have learning disabilities also um, can have a, a, a really st a strength in, even if it's one particular area, and you know, a, a, a score, an IQ score, isn't necessarily going to show that. Right, okay, great. Um, in terms of the extracurriculars, it was, I don't know if anybody caught this, um, when the older kids were playing the ukulele, the other kids were like hugging each other and so forth. And it just, it shows you the extracurricular activity is not just about the activity, it is about the bonds and the relationships that form, not just between student and student, but student and teacher. And then Connor's documentary like highlighted that again. and. It's, it's our extracurricular program, we get our biggest bang for our buck out of it. It's it, like, we don't spend that much and we get so much for it and so much student engagement. It's really our best spent money. Um, and since we're sharing personal anecdotes, um, I will say I, I went to school here, as everybody knows, so I have a lot of opportunities to reflect on what it was like to be a student. And when I think about my time at North Shore, really all I think about are the extracurricular activities. Like, that's what I always think about. And I know that what I was involved in high school, the student government and this leadership class that I took, I know that had an enormous impact on my life. Like. I don't think I would be a trustee without those early experiences that gave me the confidence to do this type of thing. And I know, Connor, you probably feel the same way that that these early experiences are going to have are really charting your path forward. So I just want to say thank you for that. Andrew, you forgot your science teaching uh, experiences were also great. What? Your science teacher gave you your Oh, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> It was, it really was those early experiences that played so, really helped me become who I am. It's still a work in progress. Okay, any other comments? I just want to say thank you for uh, everything, Dr. Smythe, the team who's here. I forgot to recognize Ms. Green earlier on, so I want to recognize you, and um, the video is very touching. Um, it did make me cry, but I'm a crier, so. But it, it really was amazing, Connor, and uh, knowing you uh, since you were in kindergarten. I hate to embarrass you for a second. It's just amazing to see. I think it's such a good example of the North Shore journey, what you're becoming, your interests. Um, and um, I did want to just um, address something that Trustee Cashman said about like something that we worry about is we don't have a lot of sorting in North Sure. I think one thing that hit me when I first started working here is how open the choices are. Miss Imperial and Dr. McBrook spoke about that at the high school level. You don't have to like prove to some supreme god that you're worthy of AP World History to get into it. And that there's something special about that. Um, but where we, you know, and students do make those decisions, and there's some fluctuation. But I do worry at sometimes with sorting with accelerated courses at the lower level where we do do it. And how students feel about that, um, like a have or have not type mentality. We want to look at that. We've had students tell us, you know, we accelerate in math, Dr. Z, Dr. Smythe. What about, why don't we accelerate in English? Or why don't we accelerate in social studies? So I think there's just some interesting areas to look at. And it also relates to grading. And I think the, the research on grading and how we want to grade for movement and progress and account for late bloomers. There are all these things that we're talking about and we need to focus in on more. Oh, so that's it. And I should say, you know, if you make the superintendent cry, you get extra points. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I'd like to open up the floor for public comments. Anybody would like to go to the microphone? Huh? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right. 
I will now close the floor for public comments and we will move on to action 12 personnel. We're going to do A3, A through N. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. And thank you. Um, all, uh, comments, questions? All in favor? I thank you. Okay, action 13, we're gonna do A and B. This is a donation from the North Shore Parent Organizations as well as from the Glenwood Landing SCA. Do I have a motion? Okay, questions? Second. Uh, I just have Go to ahead. say, very exciting to hear about the greenhouse going in uh, with Glenwood Landing uh, outdoor space. It's Really cool. I can't wait to see where they're going to put it, how big it's going to be, what's going to grow in it. Very good. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Action 14, a memorandum of agreement between the BOE and the part-time bus drivers unit. Thank you. Um, questions? Comments? I wanted to say that obviously negotiations are what they are. We we have nine units here at this, uh, at this institution, but this is such an they all are, but it's such an important unit, and we're so appreciative of our community members and those folks who are in this unit uh, that I'm really looking forward to uh, moving past the negotiation part and getting to the uh, getting to the non-negotiation part. We can just enjoy the the uh, the benefit of their great services and care for our kids. They they handle every day. Thank you, Dave, for mentioning that. Any time I see a bus on the road, I always think of what you said. One day you said, did you ever see our buses? They are beautiful. And I got to tell you, every time I see a bus, I always think about that. I notice the beauty in our buses, and then I notice some of the other buses that aren't as beautiful that are driving on the streets that aren't ours. All in favor. Thank you. All right, action 15, the policy concerns about curricular or instructional materials. Motion? Motion. And thank you. Questions, comments? You to the policy committee. This was a slog. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you. All right, we're going to take 16 and 17. Um, Motion? Second. Okay. All right. Questions? All in, all in favor? Thank you. All right, action 18A through D and 19A. These are our special education services contracts and our consultant agreement. And I will say, I know the consultant and she is amazing. We are very lucky to be approving this contract. Um, motion? Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. And committee reports. Who would like to start? Go ahead, Maria. Start, I have a really short one for lack. Um, it's still early, you know, planning is underway for the legislative breakfast. Um, subcommittees are formed and staffed. We actually had a very good meeting, but it was very, you know, just kind of procedural last month. And we are meeting again next week. So um, lots more to come. Thank you. Construction steering, we don't want to do that one. Committee meetings can, I mean, we, the can report we, can, can be deal? short. Yeah. Um, construction is continuing to move ahead. Uh, our, uh, hopefully at homecoming, people stopped and saw the mock-up of what our new exterior is going to look like, which will be gorgeous. Um, also, this we uh, we finalized some, we, we picked some finalists for the sign design for our new electric sign. So hopefully that um, is gonna go into production soon. I'm glad I have other people who are on those calls to, to check me. Um, the interior in, continues to move ahead and we have a lot of those spaces open. It's my understanding that the bathrooms are going to be ready for our play. Um, I, I'm getting nods. So the new bathrooms in the auditorium are slated to be ready for and operational for the play next in a week. And, um, I'm getting yeses. Um, I mean, there's a lot of notes here, but those, that's, that's the, the 
the meat of it, I think. Dave, am I missing anything? I mean, there's so much we cover. So by definition, yes, but you, I think you caught, you caught the highlights. The other big thing I think I would mention is uh, the solar installation and the EPC is moving along really, really well as well. So uh, we're starting to read the benefits of that. That, of course, uh, with the EPC is a guaranteed payback um, with the installation that the improvements we make in lighting and efficiency will pay us back over time as part of a guarantee. And so it's nice to see that, you know, really so moving along so quickly. Um, Trustee Russo, last meeting in new business also identified something that we're talking about in construction and steering, which is the, the decorating around the um, dust collection mechanisms that are outside the shop. So if anyone's listening at home and they have opinions about um, what or how we should um, decorate that or if we should leave a plank, this is something that the committee is also um, and, and we're interested, of course, in what this, this body um, con considers as well. Wellness? Yeah. Actually met twice. Um, we met on October 2nd for our first meeting and just discussed how meetings are going to be broken up into three topics, physical, mental, and nutrition or healthy eating. Um, and, you know, to just discuss how the meeting's gonna operate, where we gather feedback and perspectives from students, parents, and faculty, and report on progress. And then we kind of opened it up to see what other areas we should focus on, and talked about rainy day activities like cornhole, ping pong in the middle school, nutrition committee events, cybersecurity, mindful school initiatives, which Dan Doherty garnered a grant for us, and teachers are going to be trained on that. Um, and then we met again on October 23rd, and that meeting was focusing on mental wellness. We talked about the CASA digital safety presentation the, that happened a couple of weeks ago, public and permanent, which was really informative and excellent. Um, Dr. Alyssa Brown came last week, I think it was last week, <laughs> um, and to talk about handling traumatic events with children and just conversations about difficult topics. That was well attended also and really informative. And then we talked about Unity Day, which was um, activities promoting togetherness, being inclusive and accepting and collaboration. You were there, Andrea, did I miss anything? <laughs> My health and safety. I, oh, I have it, I have it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so we, we met twice this year. Um, the building level plans have been approved and uploaded. The drills are on schedule. Staff continues to do different kinds of employee training on mental health and sexual harassment. Um, we talked a little bit about construction. I won't repeat that. Um, the camera's on the bus. We approved it, as you guys remember. The bus patrol is gonna do the installation. Um, we talked a little bit about the Scudders Lane and Glen Cove Avenue crosswalk. Um, if I got it right, the Scudders Lane crosswalk lining needs to be painted. And then the Glen Cove Avenue crosswalk, um, they, Nassau County felt that there were no need for changes there. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'll know the answer, though. So that, But that's the one... Yeah, I'm shocked that they, I wish they yeah. were here, you know, when there are people blocking that crosswalk and students can't cross. That's that's Could kind I of, get it wrong or no, I got it. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's correct. I mean, We've just been struggling so many... to get attention, you know, from the county on, on issues with that that road. The one, that one is the reason I, you know, I'm sort of it's a bee in my bonnet is I've noticed that the, the, the blocks before it and after it have do not block the side street signs and the one with the crosswalk though it does have you know the picture of the pedestrian but there's no there's no nothing re uh, we need reinforcement because people block it all the time they 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 don't care they don't worry about blocking the street and therefore they're blocking the crosswalk i see it every day it's really surprising yes wi-fi is operational we're going to get signage to inform visitors um, my never ending request to have the suicide hotline on the ID badges. 
Um, I actually, at this conference I was at, they talked about two hotline numbers that like all students should receive. So I took a photo of it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I know yeah. I know we're just reporting, but I did want to say um, when we were talking, we're working on it. Okay. I talked to Dr. Kirsch yesterday about it. We're, we Actually, an idea that I had is putting a few numbers on there uh, that students might need um, because of multiple things they could see on the athletic field. Or uh, I was thinking with him, brainstorming of all the situations they could be in and they have been in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna send, I'll, I'll send it to you later. Um, and I think this is important to mention, you know, we've been talking about bus safety a lot and it came up in health and safety that when we have our um, chartered bus or buses, our bus depot, Michelle Hall, also inspects them before they go out. And she recently found issues prior to a bus trip. And so it just reinforces what a good decision it was just generations ago to have our own busing company. I'm sorry, I'm still on the crosswalk. There was mention, and I'm sorry, Dr. Zeno, I think it was something you said in fairly recent weeks about, or uh, maybe George Pumbar, maybe in, in a discussion with George, that the county was going to do a survey? What it is, is it's actually um, a resident who is going to help us, who's, um, it's um, Dan Flanzig, who's um, a parent. He's a bike bike safety specialist lawyer. Uh, he knows somebody who works for Cohen's who's coming actually um, to meet like informally to just to give us like advice on the drop off and how it works. And they've handled that. Uh, this person's handled that in other situations. So I'm hoping my next update to you and at our next meeting to have some guidance. Um, and um, basically, the, the arrival issue is that is a safety issue. Uh, the traffic on Glen Cove Avenue, perennial issue here, and <laughs> not sure. Um, and so we're going to look for um, it, it's it's multiple causation. So the solution has to be multi pronged. You know, it's start times. It's the flow of traffic, possible construction, you know, all things that trustees here have talked about for, for years. So we're going to try and coalesce it and, and make a plan of attack. Just remembering last year, or maybe it was the year before, the safety, the, the safety committee talked about, um, it was on, I believe it was on Scudder's Lane, um, getting another stop sign. Do you remember that, Rich? I can't, I can't quite recall the details of it anymore. And ultimately, the, there was, ultimately action though there had been resistance so i'm kind of i don't want to let this one die because i just think uh, it's just from having really seen a student trying to cross one day and it was really not it was dangerous really dangerous just wondering maybe you should try to pursue it as a citizen yeah, i was i was thinking yeah. also about the legislative action committee. yeah that's something we should bring there all right. The board is interested. In All right. Let, let's 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 keep it to committee reports, though, and then we can go. I was just going to say athletic advisory. Yeah. You, go ahead. Um, I missed. Well, I have a report from the first one, which was September 18th, but the second one on October 16th, I was on that NISPA annual delegates call until midnight, so I missed the second one. But um, I can give you an update on the first one. Um, we have a mix of parents, community members, student athletes, coaches, and teachers, and trying to get more community sports representatives as well. Um, we talked about how the turf field is complete. This is a little old, from, you know, September. So, um, and I just want to say it looks amazing. And I was so impressed at homecoming at not only how the turf looks, but just how the whole field looked and all the work by the booster club to, you know, have the signs up. It just looked great. Um, and high school athletes walk through their elementary schools on September 28th in preparation for homecoming. And then we talked about goals for this year. So um, we talked about student athlete leadership and service and older students helping younger students and athletes helping athletes. We talked about resources, equipment and support, presentation, grounds, replacing signs, and how that could be a community service volunteer opportunity for students as well. Um, we talked about policies and communication, role of handbooks, um, consistency regarding missing practices and penalties, talked about coaching instruction and post-secondary opportunities, 
um, perhaps having student athlete alumni speak about playing in college or careers in sports, um, you know, basically recruiting with experts. And we talked about health and wellness and maybe potentially having a practice dedicated to healthy living, stretching, diet, exercise, rest, and preventing injuries. Rich, were you at the last athletic advisor? Were you, were you, were you sick? I could speak to that. <laughs> Thanks, um, no, no. I have. The, um, we talked a lot about, we just talked about how we're searching for a varsity baseball and varsity uh, lacrosse coach. Mr. Lang is on that. We're working on that. Uh, we got into a conversation about favoritism in those, the small number of cases where you have a parent who is a coach and what other districts do. So Don and I are looking into that. Um, it does happen rarely in other places. Uh, we talked about a non-partial committee. Um, we're looking at, we're going to look at if NISBA has any recommendations on that. Uh, we talked about um, the uh, middle school uh, and new uniforms, and people were very uh, positive about that. Um, and also how boosters are working on new scoreboards uh, uh, inside the uh, middle school gymnasium and another great effort by our boosters. We talked about uh, the bigger discussion was about changing demographics and pertains to what we talked about tonight and how that might change the interests in sports. And so looking at it like we look at clubs, uh, we talked about boys volleyball, badminton, pickle roll, ball, ballroom dancing, fencing. Um, we've gotten a couple of emails about fencing this week, actually. So like we were talking about with our clubs, continuing to look at our offerings. Uh, we still don't have a middle school trainer, even though the board and the community supported that. It's just, you know, like we've been talking about with other things, it's hard finding folks. So we're still working on finding that. Uh, we do still have our 1.0 1, 1 trainer. Any other committee reports? Reporting on the community budget forum? That's not really quite. I could just, I'll just mention quickly that we had uh, our first community budget forum meeting. Um, we are working on attendance. We had, we had a, a good core group, <laughs> but, um, I, I, it, we, what we're doing this year is going line by line, which I think is actually, it's a lot, very rudimentary, but it's producing great conversations. Um, and, uh, we have our community, our revenue generation think tank. Um, that's next Thursday. We, I was going back and forth on the date a little bit, so I apologize, trustees, but it will be virtual. And then we'll set dates. Um, and I might be interested, you know, in talking to the board about getting more people invested and in maybe coming to these meetings, if they, even if they're not participating, but to watch as almost like an audience. So uh, we want to get our numbers up. I know that's also, I walked in the other day to central office and I was looking at the board goals and I'm like, that's the one I got to work on. We got to get those numbers up, um, you know, all the goals, but, but that participation we need, we need to work on, especially with those committees. All right, let's move on to unfinished business. Oh, this is exciting. New business. All right. Um, I will adjourn the meeting. Everyone have a good evening. <laughs>